Hey, listeners, we have a special word from one of our partners on the show. Now, you know and I know that ministry right now, especially in the West, in this post-Christian context that we're in, whatever that means, it's harder. It's getting more and more tiresome. But that's why Midwestern Seminary, this month of October for Pastor Appreciation Month, wants to express the deepest thanks to all of the full-time pastors, associate pastors, lead pastors, elders, lay leaders in the church, anyone who's in a position of ministry leadership in the church, we want to say with Midwestern Seminary that we appreciate you. Midwestern believes that what Jesus believes to be precious, that which he purchased with his own blood, should be important to us as well. And that's why they exist for the church. We love the work that they're doing. And as a thank you to those that are in ministry, they want to let you know that there's all sorts of free resources available to read online, to download, to listen to podcasts, videos, articles, all sorts of things and giveaways happening all the time at mbts.edu slash pastors. Again, that's mbts.edu slash pastors. If you're in ministry Why don't you check out what's over there, see what they have for you, and know that this October and throughout the year that we here at the Missions Podcast and our partners with Midwestern Seminary, we appreciate you, and we pray that you're strengthened in the work that you're doing for the Lord. And now on to the show. And welcome to the Missions Podcast, the show that explores your hard questions on missions, theology, and practice to help goers think thinkers go. I'm Alex Kochman, Director of Communications and Media with ABWE, joined as always by Scott Dunford, who is pastor of Western Hills Church in San Mateo, California. And Scott, before we dive into today's episode, and we're, we're going to open up not the mailbag, but the news bag, which is another fun mm. thing that we do every now and again on the show. Uh, we do want to remind you, if you are a loyal listener to the show, or if this is your first time joining us, Uh, that there is a new addition to the ABWE podcasting family, which is Cloud of Witnesses. If you're interested in missionary stories, missionary biography, glimpses into the past and hearing some of the daring stories of how not only mission fields were opened and people were reached with the gospel, but also just how missionaries have dealt with the sufferings of life and the trials and triumphs that come along the way. If you think you'd be encouraged by that, and we do too, Check out cloudofwitnessespodcast.com or search for Cloud of Witnesses in your favorite podcast app. We've got another episode of Cloud of Witnesses dropping uh, a week from tomorrow at the time of this recording. We drop every other Wednesday if you're trying to catch up with our schedule and we'll be posting new episodes of season one throughout the rest of the year. We've already got four or five in the hopper at this point and so Uh, We're very encouraged by that. Scott, I know you've been encouraged. Some of these people you know from your time at ABWE, too, and you're hearing their testimonies in long form, and that's been an encouragement as well. These people that you've seen their faithfulness up close and personal, and now we also just all get to benefit from the life that they've lived, the faith that they've exercised. Well, how many times, you know, have you picked up a missionary biography of someone you've never heard of before? You read it, and you're like, I can't believe I had never heard this story before. This is su- super impactful. Well, I think that's what this this podcast did. And I, w- I want to circle back because you you said they're welcome to the family, of, you know, the missions podcast family. I want to know, like, did the missions podcast take a wife or did we adopt a child? I, I would love to define the relationship at some point there, Alex. Either way, you listen to these stories and go like, yeah, this is this is missionary biography in in audio and video form. And it's just a, a beautiful thing to listen to. It's going to encourage your heart and soul. And especially these are people that most of them are not famous. And yet you see God's faithfulness. It doesn't just work in the lives of famous missionaries like Hudson Taylor. Uh, he's at live and at work in lives of missionaries today. And uh, so that that's a very encouraging uh, new podcast that I hope people will download and listen and uh, find as much encouragement from it as, as we have. Yeah, and Scott, you know and I know that God is at work through ordinary people in hidden places, people whose names we've never heard of, people who, when we're all before the throne someday, a lot of them are going to be so much closer (laughs) to the throne Mm. than we are because of their faithfulness. And maybe that's as good a segue as any to discuss really what's happening across the world. We Even in the missions community, I think we can so easily think that What's happening is only what we're aware of in our circles, in our networks, what's right in front of us. 
or if you're listening from a mission field somewhere, maybe you're only thinking about that place. And I think it's helpful to come up for air every now and again and look at how God's moving across the world and not just in the headlines that are being discussed, you know, that are that are at the top mm-hmm. of your news feed, right? Everything that, that we're being told to focus on, but also things that don't get noticed as quickly. Scott, I know you're always perusing the news. What do you yeah. have for us? Well, and, and I think part of why we want to do this every so often, I think the last one we did was probably in May. Um, but the reason we do this every so often is because we want people to not read the news just from a political lens or an economic lens, but to really see how things that are happening around the world affect the cause of Christ globally and global Christianity and the spread of the gospel. And so hopefully this is just one more episode that helps us do that. So we're going to start big and then we're going to get small. So the first story we have, and we need to get like a nice little, like, you know, CBS news kind of, you know, news bulletin kind of going in the back. We'll get our, we'll get downtown Dave, our producer working on that. Um, But uh, the first story comes from the UN meeting. And so a lot of us follow the UN very fit. No, we don't. But, uh, but this is an interesting story. (laughs) You can't even say Uh, it with a straight face. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Because, because the uh, secretary general of the UN came out and said, this he goes the world is becoming unhinged as geopolitical tensions rise and it seems incapable of coming together to respond to mounting challenges the u.n secretary general antonio guterres has said in his speech opening the u.n general assembly in new york he said global governance was stuck in time at a point when strong modern multilateral institutions we're in greater need than ever. Isn't that interesting? Strong, modern, mm. multinational institutions are in greater need than ever. Oh and yet he's also going on to say the world's becoming unhinged. As a Christian, how do you how do you listen to that that concept of the world is becoming unhinged? Does that surprise you? <laughs> so much I want to say. Now's <laughs> uh, your chance, I Alex. Last, I think the last yeah. time I followed the UN in detail was oil for food scandal um, okay. under Kofi yeah. Annan. So that that probably dates me a little bit. Um, it, well, I, the peacekeeping has been so successful. Oh, wait, never it mind. It has. Um, it yeah. has. Um, no, really, the things are going great um, <laughs> worldwide. Uh, it, when I hear any of the world's elite talking about modern multilateral institutions, I immediately get the heebie-jeebies, right? I, I, I'm not encouraged by that thought. Uh, there's a part of me that, that says that if the, if the world elites are, are discouraged at the trends that they see, then, then maybe we should be encouraged, <laughs> depending mm, yeah. on what they're yeah. pointing to. Um, at the same time, unhinged is probably a pretty good word for what a lot of us have observed in the world for the last couple of years. Um, this year, and, and really, especially since COVID being that erupting point for so many different things. And it, I, I think collectively as a society, we feel like we're in a time warp ever since then. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll take it. Sure, the world is unhinged in a lot of ways. I mean, not to give kind of a Sunday school answer, but let's give the Sunday school answer, though. Jesus is Lord. The nations are mm-hmm. raging. And yet the Lord has set his king on Zion. Uh, and has has commanded the nations to come to Christ. That's the only way to be saved from this mm-hmm. chaos. And I think if the last few years have taught people anything, it's that it is Christ or chaos. Uh, and, and and in reality, we want world leaders to recognize, yeah. hey, it's chaotic right now, uh, because right. maybe then they'll be more disposed to embrace the solution. Yeah, I'd say I'd just a couple things to that. One, I say this to my kids all the time, but this is what we should see if the Bible is true, right? So if the Bible is true, then when the world acts in ways that are in rebellion against God's right ways and rule, we should expect the breakdown of society. We shouldn't expect flourishing. And that's what we're seeing around the world is a breakdown of society, a breakdown of civility, and a breakdown of human civilization and human flourishing, which is what you get when you don't follow after God's ways. Yeah, exactly. The other part that I think, though, is important for us as we listen as Christians, we shouldn't just be on the sideline celebrating uh, the chaos in the world because there is it does cause problems and it causes us to, to be it should be more in prayer. And we've, we've been blessed in some ways. Uh, the, 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 the relative peace of the last, you know, decades has allowed some things to happen, even spiritually, uh, globally that are incredible and a blessing, but we need to remember as things break down, there are vulnerable people and it puts our missionaries at risk. It puts the national Christians at risk. We're going to talk about some of those stories coming up in a bit, but it should also cause it should, so it should cause us to pray and to be thinking about, especially those places that are most vulnerable and really keep those believers in prayer uh, during this time. But and also remembering God often works in miraculous ways in saving people and drawing them to himself through 
uh, the crises that are happening around the world. With that in mind, let's, let's go over to, um, I'm actually going to, I'm going to come back to the, to a story that we had, but I'm going to go to, cause this is a good segue to our, our story on Morocco and Libya. Mm. Many of you have been watching the news, um, and saw, you know, a, a massive earthquake in, in Morocco, uh, thousands were killed. And then the Libya, um, the, the big, huge, I don't think it was called a tsunami, but a giant wave come, came in and, and killed I mean, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people were missing, which is just so hard to even fathom. I mean, I live close to the coast. I cannot imagine a wave hitting San Francisco and wiping out 20,000 people. Um, and yet that's what happened. And yet there's this beautiful story in Christianity today um, about how Christians in Morocco, which you don't think of Christians in Morocco. I mean, I don't. Uh, you tend to think about them being a very probably persecuted minority, and they are. But but there was a, a, a part of the story that said, the latest U.S. State Department report on Morocco indicates that while undermining the Islamic religion is punishable with up to five years in prison, there are no known cases of Christians running afoul of this law. But that's, this is an excerpt, but that Sunday, the former Muslims had other concerns on their mind, concerns being this massive uh, human tragedy. And they are asking questions like, why did it happen? We cannot know. Was it because of sin? We cannot know. Was it a test like with Job? We cannot know, said uh, Ahmad, who led, led the lengthy discussion. All we know is that God allowed it to happen and his ways are righteous. We keep our faith in him and encourage in their walk. This is the Christian minority. They went out to serve. And they began to serve uh, the Moroccan Muslims. Um, this little thirty-six member, uh, th- this little thirty-six member union of Christian churches, and uh, they began ministering to the people around them. And I just think, what a beautiful story of a small persecuted church. And we, you know, we think of what you know we need to do stuff in Morocco, and yet. God's using the church that is in Morocco, small and weak though they may be, yeah. to have an impact in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with others. Um, I just, I just love that story and stories like that when we see national Christians just uh, stepping up and following Jesus. We saw very similar things in reaction to the earthquake that affected Turkey and Syria back in February. Mm-hmm. Uh, we in our magazine, in, in in Message Magazine from ABWE, uh, we were able to published stories of, of people who are volunteers, uh, Muslim backgrounds saying, I want to hear more about this Jesus because of the response of the Christians, right? Going mm-hmm. back throughout all of church history, the way that Christians respond by loving not only their sick and dying and hurting, but also the lost and needy of other nations and of the world uh, has always really stood out to the unbelieving watching world. And that's a critical yeah. part of our mission. Now, I see things maybe from a, a just a a slightly different perspective. I'm connected to some Christians who are in that part of the world that we're talking Mm -hmm. about with this story in particular. And I receive some updates and know of some of the ministry that's happening there. And so I'm just all the more encouraged because I've seen that be a door opener in some of their conversations. You know, Morocco is one of these countries where there is this desire to be uh, in good standing with the West. And we know, you know, that anyone who's seen Casablanca knows that it, it, there's a lot of travel that happens in and out of this country, mm-hmm. right? And so there's mm-hmm. a need to maintain good uh, diplomatic relationships and to westernize in some ways, you know, as compared with maybe some of the other uh, more traditionalist, more Sufi, or, excuse me, not Sufi, more 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 Wahhabist uh, types of Islamic mm-hmm. regimes mm-hmm. that you see across the world. But what's interesting, you know, it's it's not about whether or not a country is Western. It's about the extent to which uh, uh, the gospel is affecting mm. and transforming it. And in this case in particular, yeah, you're seeing the church unleashed even through tra- through tragedy. Yeah, and, and how much like God is that to use these tragedies um, to see people brought to him. And um, it's good to it's good to be, look, I, <laughs> to quote Mr. Rogers, uh, Alex to probably quote want to edit Mr. this out. Rogers, <laughs> the missiologist known as Fred Rogers. Yeah, go but ahead. But he said, we, you know, when you see a tragedy, look for where the helpers are. And uh, I remember that. And and we look at where the helpers are and often they're believers um, f- obeying their master, following at the example of Jesus yeah. and stepping in and serving. And it's a beautiful story. Another story, and this is very interesting to me. It, it's extremely interesting to me living in uh, California. Um, the city I live in, Fremont, is the home of the largest population of Sikhs in America. Wait, or wait a minute. I, I think half of our listening audience, you know, 12 of them. 
They were just yeah. like, wait a minute, Scott lives in Fremont, California? I, I had no idea. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, it's, yes. It's true. It's true. Yes. We assure you. Yes, I, I do. I do live here. Um, you mentioned it a time or two. <laughs> a time or two, right? And <laughs> there's a huge population of, of, of sick um, they, they say sick, but they get tired of having to explain sick, so they just go by Sikh. Um, so you've heard them called, probably called Sikhs. They, they often stand out because they wear turbans. Um, um, many of them do. Um, but but they have large populations in, in America and in, and in Canada. And there's a huge story that came out of Canada that some of you probably saw. It was in CNN about, about an assassination of a Sikh leader. So the Sikhs are a minority group in Canada. Uh, northern India, and many of you have been following uh, President Modi of India, is very popular with the West. I mean, he did, big, did a big tour over here. Um, he's mm-hmm. very popular with Indian Americans, by and large. We also have a large Indian population, and so does Pennsylvania. So I'm curious, Alex, have you yeah. heard anything about this where you're, where you're located? But um, the story went that there were credible allegations of a potential link between agents of the government of India and the killing of Nijar, a Sikh Canadian citizen who was gunned down by masked men in June. Canada's Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolly subsequently said that Ottawa had expelled an Indian diplomat, who she describes as the head of the Indian intelligence agency in in the country as a consequence. And so what we're seeing, I think what's already been happening in India for a long time, and no one's really been talking about, is that um, fundamentalist Hindu uh, government is has been putting pressure on minority religions. Christianity uh, has especially, um, but then even probably more violently, uh, Muslims and Sikhs. And now we're seeing it spill over into other nations. And, and we, we have big billboards around us that says, you know, justice for Sikhs, um, talking about mm-hmm. these kind of issues that Sikh immigrants are trying to draw attention to what's happening in India. But we have a major nation uh, committing a, you know, potentially here, at least an alleged assassination of a, of a, of a minority religion leader um, in Canada. That's a, that's a scary thought, Alex. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about a citizen of a foreign country, right? I mean, that's maybe an act of war. I mean, what do you want to consider an act of war? But I mean, that's, that's a pretty bold act anyway you you slice it now um i i think you highlighted something that's worth focusing on this is a fundamentalist hindu regime uh this is a, a hindu indian nationalist uh, regime as well and you know we have our own conversations here stateside about nationalism or christian nationalism and we go back and forth on that but but think of what hindu nationalism means for christians or means for muslims or for Six or Sikhs, mm-hmm. uh, pick the pronunciation that you want to go with. Uh, it's it's critically important to to see that that regime is really tightening down on on what they believe to be the Indian identity. Uh, we need to be aware that that's what's going on because for believers that are ministering to Hindus to Indians, uh, a, a big part of the gospel witness needs to be that to come to Christ is not to give up your Indianness. Mm-hmm. There's one sense in which when we come to Christ, we give up everything. Um, but then also we know that you sort of get it all back, mm-hmm. right? You, it, it's it's all renewed uh, by grace. Grace doesn't obliterate nature. Grace restores nature. And to be a Christian is the way to be a truest uh, Indian, right? In, in mm-hmm. the sense that God, uh, through his redeeming grace, is renewing all of life uh, ordered under all of Christ. And so... Uh, we have to be aware, though, that that oftentimes missionaries uh, going out as gospel ambassadors uh, are laboring against the the false belief that what they're advocating for is the overturn of all of the customs and ethnic and linguistic identities of the people that they're ministering to. Um, in reality, when the gospel comes in, it's separating that idea of what it means to be Hindu from what it means to be Indian, honestly. And, mm-hmm. and it, those are difficult things to uh, separate from each other, but it's calling them to Christ uh, and recognizing that you're stepping into this environment of nationalism. Now, Scott, let me just ask a question of you for, for those of us um, who may not be totally aware, maybe don't reside in Fremont, California. Uh, what what does the sick religion teach? Um, what what is that? It's it's one where I think we've all seen them and interacted with them, but but just bring us up to speed as well. It, 
many of our listeners may not be accustomed. Yeah, I'm going to give you a uh, a high level because I can't. It's all I can give. <laughs> yeah, um, I would like to say, yeah, I'm an expert on on Sikhism, but um, it, it, it's a monotheism. Let's just give you time to enter it into Chat GPT. Describe Sikhism. Go. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll let you do that right, while I'm talking. Well, I snowball. Um, but but it, it, it's a pretty peaceful religion, actually. I mean, as far as like in Fremont, the reputation are, are ones that they do a lot of good works. They show up and they volunteer and they they do a lot of things for the homeless. They're very kind people. Um, but they're a monotheistic religion. They have their own prophet and their own God, um, that they, that they worship. Um, and, and it's, and, and it's a very tight society. I mean, you see them with the turbans. So the adult men, or I shouldn't say the adult men, but once you start entering into manhood, they don't cut their hair. And so even we see the little boys starting to wear the turbans at school. I mean, in my son's school, many, many young men, uh, even that are playing football or playing basketball, you know, wear their turban. They always carry a little dagger. It's just part of their tradition that they pass down to each other that shows like kind of their, their heart and desire to, to be, uh, to be warriors for their God. Um, and so it's a very unique religion. Um, they are the big temple in our, in our town. I, they don't call it a temple, but, um, the, the big meeting house that they have, I mean, they, they serve lunch, a free lunch every single day for anyone who stops in. And so it becomes a, they, they actually are really well respected in the community uh, here in this area for the good works that they do. And so it's a, it's an interesting people it's an interesting religion, one that I certainly need to study more of. Um, but, but also, you know, they're feeling the pressure, not just of what's been going on in, in Punjab province of India, which has been under, you know, stress for many, many years. Um, but now it's starting to come to where they live uh, in the states and in Canada, and so it's a it's a, it's a little bit of a scary thing. And and I, I think it's important for us to think not just about obviously six, but but as we pray for our national partners around the world. I mean, I was in Miami a few years ago, and uh, one of our ABWE national partners was there, and he's he's Nepali, and. He was there doing some training and we were, at, we were spending some time together and he was constantly on his phone back to Nepal. And I asked him what's going on. And he shared with me that because Nepal had passed a um, a pluralistic, you know, secular constitution that was no longer a Hindu constitution, that that Modi's government in India had put an, an mm. oil embargo, a gasoline embargo, an oil embargo on Nepal. So that ne- and Nepal's kind of landlocked with India. So because of that, they could not get any gasoline. And because they could not get gasoline, his wife was in danger of running out, which meant that she couldn't get water out of their well. And here, you know, here we are in Miami, Florida, with, you know, these kind of like Hindu nationalist policies affecting someone that I'm sitting in the same room with about his wa- his wife may not have water and may die uh, with their young child in Nepal because of these kind of policies. And so we kind of take for granted, you know, living in yeah. a world that has a religious freedom, but that's just not the case for so many uh, believers around the world. And it puts them at great risk. And so I think just these kind of stories help bring to mind one, how much we need to be praying for about global politics and just praying for, for religious freedom. And, you know, I think that's what Peter called us to do. You know, pray that we can live quiet and peaceable lives. Just pray that we can, that, God, yeah. that, that, that our governments just leave us alone enough that we can worship <laughs> and serve the Lord with freedom. And that's a, a good prayer that we should be praying not only for ourselves, but for um, our, our believer brothers and sisters in other nations. Yeah. And, and just to, to harp on that for just a second, mm-hmm. be praying for that specifically. Uh, for the believers in India. Uh, I was speaking mm-hmm. today uh, with an individual who ministers in India, and uh, they they are seeing um, an, an increase of uh, curiosity uh, on, on the part of the government there. And of course, China has its tentacles in uh, India as well, uh, mm-hmm. obviously them being neighbors. Uh, but, there, but there's so much happening there. And, and of course, you're also dealing with a part of the world that just has the largest concentration of, of people period, including on reaching people. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And so just, just understanding the, the, the mass of humanity that's represented by this piece of land. Mm-hmm. Um, so absolutely praying for the people of India there. So then switching to a totally different people group than one we might normally think of. Um, and, and I'm going to preface this with just a little bit of a story, Alex, and I, you were not, you and I were talking 
but having visited separately the Bible Museum, I think it's called the, Muse- the Bible Museum or the Museum of the Bible. Yeah, Museum um, of the Bible. Down, yeah. in, down in Washington D.C. Highly and recommend. Enter, yeah, and there, there's a few there's a few images there that just stick with you as you as you go through it, and it's a really well done museum. But one is the is the room full of Bible translations, and you walk in and they've got the colors that have been translated in one color, and then the the Bibles that have yet to be translated in another color, and it's shocking how many languages still need the gospel in their language. There's a section um, of whole of deaf Bibles. And uh, last week was the national week of the deaf or international week of the deaf. And it's highlighted the fact that most deaf people don't have access to the gospel. In fact, only 2% of the 300, 250, 300 million deaf people in the world are Christians. And out of those, you know, out of, out of that population, um, it says 98% have no access to God's word in their language. Now, Alex, you and I were talking, I'll let you jump in yeah. here, but why is, why you, know, you think, well, the deaf people, they can just read the English Bible or whatever Bible in their language. Why is that a problem? Right. Cause that is the question. And maybe people are listening and objecting to that thinking, don't they have the same access, um, to literature that anyone else would have? And people don't realize that, especially for those who are young, uh, who are who are deaf from a young age, uh, who maybe their their first language really is uh, ASL or or some other sign language, uh, ASL American Sign Language. It's safe to say it's not the same language as English. Mm-hmm. There's a different structure. There's a different grammar, and it doesn't transcribe neatly into written words. And we take for granted the extent to which written words do refer to sounds. And without the context of sounds uh, and, and, and the way verbal speech is conducted and even inflected, even though ours is not a, a, a tonal language in that way, uh, it still provides all the context that you need to understand a written language. So the way that I would illustrate this is imagine explaining what the definite article is, the, right, or an indefinite article, the A, explaining that to a, a person in sign language and to a person who, who can't read. Right. And, and then it gives you some sense of just how different these linguistic systems are. And so for somebody who, who doesn't read the English written word, it's amazing. These people live in our communities here in the States and, of course, throughout the world. And yet many of them, the statistic that you shared, have little to no access to the gospel. I mean, even just anecdotally, maybe you've had this experience mm-hmm. in churches that you've been in. In our church, we have a young girl who uh, happens to be hearing impaired. And even we're trying to wrap our minds around how do we help her through the service How do we help her through Sunday school? How do we help her through each of these elements? Because we've we've got one or two people here who speak some sign, not speak, but they they can sign. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. She has family members that are at the church. And still, it is a challenge to think through how can we show hospitality to her. And again, this is in a church. If we're struggling to figure out how to do that within a church, how much more so is that a challenge on the mission field, especially among deaf peoples who maybe they can't read the written form of their trade language at all. And so they're excluded Mm -hmm. ordinarily from a lot of evangelistic efforts, right? Yeah, huge, huge percentages of of depression and suicide among the deaf. Um, You know, we have a we have a large deaf school. So Fremont has an unusually large deaf population and, and they they become very isolated, you know, in the fact that they do things together. And so, you know, it, it's one of those things where the, when the gospel breaks in, it can break in in a strong, powerful way. In fact, uh, ABWE has some missionaries to the deaf and they have an amazing ministry, um, but they're just so much more needed. And, you know, a lot of churches just don't, aren't, aren't well equipped to reach them. And of course, then we think about Bible translations that need to be done in these languages around the world um, that to, so they can have the written word as well, which, you know, we understand is obviously is crucial to have in your own, in your own heart language. And for deaf, that means sign language and, and the sign language is different between China and, and ASL American sign language and other nations. They all have their own. And so a um, huge, huge need. And I just want, it's a good to be reminded of a people group that, live among us and uh, need to be reached with the gospel. And maybe God would put that on someone's heart uh, to, to call, take up that mantle and and begin reaching them. If you want to come out here and join us, uh, we could use some people who can do uh, deaf evangelism and deaf, deaf church planting. That'd be a huge need. And so then transitioning to our last story, Alex, um, at least for this time, 
Um, you know, many, many people have, have heard of Armenia. Um, some people get confused between Armenians and Armenians. Um, <laughs> there is a difference. Ever, yes, there is a difference. Um, um, On this show, Ar- we are neither. <laughs> right. But there is an inner, it's, you know, it's interesting because, you know, what well, people haven't, I mean, they obviously know many Armenians. Uh, they end up meeting them and just don't realize they're Armenians. But uh, amazing cultural heritage, amazing mm-hmm. Um, you know, cont- contributions they've made, but also people are unaware of the fact that Armenia is the oldest Christian, one of the very oldest Christian kingdoms in the world. And yet they've, they've gone through something that's just uh, pretty horrific and that there was a massive genocide of Armenians um, uh, at the hands of the Ottoman Empire uh, back around, I don't remember the date right now, but in the early 1900s, and that mm-hmm. that is gl- largely gone unreported because of geopolitics. Right. And right. Um, Armenia is situated in a very unique little enclave there between Turkey and Azerbaijan in the middle of uh, what is often thought of as the Muslim world nowadays. Um, but there's a story uh, that, that you forwarded me, Alex, and I'll let you kind of talk about it a little bit more. Tens of thousands of Armenian Christians persecuted in Nagorno uh, Karabakh. Um, and yeah. it, why is this a story that Christians need to be paying attention to? Yeah, a little more context there. I mean, we're talking about 120,000 Armenian Christians uh, dealing with a, a military blockade and what essentially amounts to the threat of genocide. And this has been happening for months now. This didn't just happen last week. The story that I'm looking at from the National Religious Broadcasters, NRB, NRB NRB.org, is dated from August. And so it's been happening since at least the summer. Uh, You you talk about what is the significance of this. And there's a couple of things I think that we need to point to. Uh, This is the oldest Christian nation uh, in the world. They Christianized in 301 AD. For those of you church historians, that's before the Edict of Milan. Right. So the, the hmm, very early crazy. in the history of the church uh, is is when the Armenian people um, were exposed to and embraced uh, the gospel. Um, and today you make reference to the Ottomans. Well, you know, Erdogan in Turkey, you know, there, there's all the geopolitics caught up here with Turkey being, you know, theoretically a NATO ally. But but he is attempting to restore something like an Ottoman Empire. And unfortunately, loyalties being what they are. Uh, that makes a lot of Western powers, including the U.S., unwilling to ask Turkey and their allies in Azer- Azerbaijan to stop this persecution against the Armenian Christians. That's something where even those in the U.S., the U.S. listeners, can contact their local representatives and say, what are we, what are we doing? Are we, are we asking Turkey to stop this? What are we doing at a national level? Uh, there's things there that can and should be done. Uh, The other thing I think that's important for us to remember is we do look at this part of the world. It is hard for a lot of us to even find these countries on the map. And when we look at that piece of the world, we think of that as the Islamic world. And yet we go back to that great Abraham Kuyper quote that that there's not a single square inch of the universe over which the risen Christ, who's Lord of all, does not scream and shout that it's mine, right? That every square Mm -hmm. inch of creation belongs to the reigning and risen Lord Jesus Christ. This is not Islamic territory. This was, uh, number one, exposed to the gospel long before an individual named Muhammad ever set foot on this earth. And secondly, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, right? We need to be thinking about the fact, frankly, that that missions didn't begin with William Carey. It didn't Uh begin with Billy Graham, right? That the gospel Uh has been advancing. And so we have more in common with these Armenian Christians who I'm sure we've got all sorts of theological distinctions with. I'm sure we would be probably weirded out by a lot of the smells and bells of maybe the way that they worship. And I, I don't know, I'm assuming, but we have more in common with them than we do our secular neighbors in the U.S., many of us. Mm. And we're called to be praying for them. We're called to be globally minded and we're called to be uh, recognizing that we stand on the shoulders of giants in church history as the gospel has advanced across nations and kingdoms and cultures and continents. Right, Scott? Amen. Amen. That's so true. And so it, it, it should cause us to pay attention to what's happening. And I, I think it's just important, like we said at the very beginning of the show, when we re- when you read the news, obviously you're going to read it according to, you know, what's going how's it going to affect you personally. But as Christians, I think we ought to be reading the news through a Christian lens. And I think through a through a missions lens, for back, for lack of a better word, or through a globally Christian lens, how does what is going on in the world um, affect uh, the spread of the gospel? How does it 
what is going around on around the world affect missionaries and their ability to share the gospel. And it should drop us as Christians to our knees and be praying. It reminds me of, you know, of Paul's prayer, uh, for, for to the to the Ephesian believers in in in, in chapter Ephesians chapter six, asking praying for boldness uh, to be able to share the gospel effectively, and so we need to be reading the news not just with the eye on how it's going to affect the stock market or how it's going to affect the U.S. Uh, um, government, but but reading about it, thinking how is it going to affect the cause of Christ around the world, and then begin engaging in prayer for what's happening around the world. So hopefully this has been helpful. Uh, appreciate the the opportunity to just even talk about some of these things together and just process it together, Alex. The other thing that I'll throw out here, Scott, and push back on me if you disagree, but I, I don't think that we were made to know as much as we know, right, in this information <laughs> totally feel age. feel that way. Oh, yes. yeah. How can you possibly oh, handle all of the news stories that are coming your way, you know, yeah. given to you at the same exact time as advertisements, and it's all treated as equally important? And there's always someone on the internet upset at you for being happy when, you know, yeah. So many people are suffering in X yeah. part of the world. Yes, of course. Yeah. And number one, I, I think that being in our churches trains us for that, though. Mm. The fact that when I show up on a Sunday morning, I need to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. There might be somebody mm-hmm. there this week who suffered a miscarriage. Right. There's maybe somebody there who we had somebody who got married on a Saturday, come to church the next morning. God bless them. They weren't on their honeymoon yet. Right. <laughs> and so you're celebrating with them at the same time. And, yeah. and as a member of the body of Christ, we do have to learn how to live in that tension. Uh, at the same time, God doesn't expect us to know everything. He does. He's sovereign. He knows everything. What we need to do, though, is what what can we do? What can we act on with what we've been given? What can we do within our spheres of influence? Mm-hmm. The book of Proverbs, chapter 17, it says the fool's eyes are on the ends of the earth, right? So don't be focusing on things that you don't touch at all. But, man, if you've mm. heard these four or five news stories here, mm. look at our show notes can you at least read one of these articles? Can you at least pray for each of these things, mm-hmm. right? Can, can you pray for Christ to be displayed in this world that's unhinged? Mm-hmm. Can you pray for the believers in Libya and in Morocco who are ministering to those in need and that they would have gospel conversations? You know, can you pray for those who are uh, in the Sikh community to come to faith in Christ? Can you pray for the Armenian Christians? There's all these things that we can at least, even if it's a whispered prayer, I think the Lord hears those things. I think the Lord honors those things if they're sincere, right? Scott, why don't we go a little bit off script here? Why don't you pray for us while we're mm. recording here? Pray with us, the listeners. We'll, we'll amen your prayer. And uh, we know that the Lord hears and, and honors those things. That's great. I would lo- love to do that. Father, we come before you today as your children and recognizing that, um, that you've called, out, called us out from among the nations that were at war with you and you've established a new kingdom and a new people, a nation of priests to our God. And it's because of that, that we are so intricately connected to believers around the world. And so Lord, we, we, we mourn with those who mourn. We rejoice with those who rejoice. And Lord, we rejoice that you've raising up your church in places like Morocco um, that are, that are sharing the good news in the middle of difficult circumstances where we, we mourn the fact that the brokenness of our world is causing chaos around the world, that, that nations are in chaos, um, that people are being persecuted Lord for their faith and even assassinated in different places. Uh, Lord, we mourn for all those things. Those just signs of the brokenness of our world. But Lord, we also rejoice in that you've given us the hope for all the nations, that that when Christ came into the world, it was peace on earth um, and goodwill to those with whom he is mm-hmm. pleased. And so, Lord, we rejoice that, that Jesus is the hope of the nations. And so, God, give us boldness, give us energy, give us um, courage, give us motivation to take this good news to a world that's increasingly becoming aware of the fact that they are desperately in need of something that they cannot find on their own. Um, Help us to be bold to declare that the happiness they seek and the joy and peace that they seek can only be found in your provision through Jesus Christ. And so we lift up these nations to you. We lift up the missionaries that are serving among them to you. We lift up the national believers in those places to you. And we ask that you will do exceedingly abundantly more than we could ask or think. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Scott, thank you for that. And listeners, thank you for joining us. And this is a little bit different, but we hope that you're encouraged and that you've also been edified and upbuilt by this conversation as well as every conversation that we have here each week. 
uh, every Sunday night at 7 p.m. And one way that you can express your appreciation, we appreciate it every time we get a new review from you guys. Now, if you don't love the show, be honest with us, right? But but be hot or cold. Don't be lukewarm, right? Either five stars or one star. None of this three star, four star, either, either love it or you hate it, right? Now, don't lie to us, right? But if you've been blessed by the show, feel free to drop us a review in your podcast platform of choice, especially Apple Podcasts. Go ahead and click follow in Apple Podcasts or subscribe depending on the app that you choose. And again, all of those things come together, get calculated in the supercomputer of the algorithm and result in more people seeing it, more people being blessed and encouraged and sent out on mission as a result of it. You can also partner with us at missionspodcast.com slash support if the Lord would lead you to do so. We appreciate all of those who have given and we could use more partners, especially this time of year as we look at a new budget cycle and a new interesting year heading ahead of us. And we appreciate all of you who are a part of the listening family. The Missions Podcast is a ministry of ABWE. To learn more about ABWE, go to abwe.org. And while you're there, why don't you check out on the homepage, scroll down a little bit to our demo event. If you're interested in taking your next step in missions, whatever that is, if it's as a goer or as a sender or some other role in between, you can find out at a weekend at our international headquarters here outside Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. That's abwe.org and hit the demo button down at the bottom. We'd love to see you here and meet you in person. Until next week, thank you for listening. Lord bless.